voices or views. This is Politics Black. What's happening, family? What's up, Los Angeles? How's we everybody? are live and we are back. After we worked out a couple of little, small little technical difficulties, but we're here with you today, and we are we are excited about this show. We are back for a special, a very special episode of Politics in Black. Once again, brought to you by ADO West Los Angeles. Woo-hoo. Again, I am only one half of your hosting team. My name is Chad Brown. Sitting across from me is looking lovely in her yellow, the <laughs> Howard Bi- Bison oh. alum. Friday Jones. Hey, everybody. Friday Jones here with you guys representing our HBCUs today. Yeah. Uh, HBCU t-shirt day. You know I had to do it for the Lou. <laughs> Somebody got to represent the HBCUs in the black belt. You feel me? So we got a show today, Friday. We do. And we uh, there no, we have a break today. Just one. One, one brief break. Power-packed show on reparations, conversations yes. that we need to have to really explore yes. um, the ADOS voice and the advocacy for uh, descendants of slavery here in these United States. Absolutely. So. 90 minutes, we're going to come to them today. We're going to have an in-depth conversation, like you heard Friday say, about ADOS lineage, about reparations. And, you know, while the concepts of lineage or descendants of slavery and reparations are not new concepts, due to the research and the, and the tireless activism of our guests today, those concepts have been injected with new life and grassroots energy that has led to what I, what I view as a seismic shift in the black American political landscape and the manner in which politicians engage nationally with our community during this 2020 election cycle. So, you know, we watch, we listen, right, Friday, and there's been a lot of misinformation, there's been a lot of disinformation out there around both of those concepts, around ADOS lineage and about reparations. So we wanted to come to you today for a special show so we can clear the air we can set the record straight, we can give credit where credit is due, and we can make sure that we're putting information out there to combat some of this misinformation. So I'm ready to go. Buckle up, fam. Grab your libations. Make sure you got ice. Make sure it's cold. We're about to have a show that's going to that's gonna be nothing but heat today. So I'm ready. Let's do it, Friday. Let's do it. All right. So uh, Dr. William Darity, uh, A. Kirsten Mullen, and, uh, you know, we, we are reading people. We are book people. Absolutely. Uh, From Here to Equality. Uh, this is the book that they co-wrote with each other. And so, yeah, so Dr. let's bring them in. Absolutely. So Dr. Darity, Dr. William A., uh, nicknamed Sandy Darity, is a Samuel Dubois Cook Professor of Public Policy and African American Studies uh, and Economics and a director of the Samuel Dubois Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke University. He served as the chair of the Department of African and American Studies and was founding director on the Research Network on Racial and Ethnic Inequality at Duke. He earned his doctorate from NIT, that's not an easy task, y'all, and previously served as director of the Institute of African American Research, director of Moore Undergraduate Research Apprenticeship Program, and a director of Undergraduate Honors Program in Economics. Darity's research focuses on inequality by race, class, and ethnicity, stratification, economics, schooling, and the racial achievement gap. Please welcome to the podcast, Dr. William Sandy Darity. Woohoo, Dr. Darity, welcome. And with him, we have uh, the beautiful Miss A. Kirsten Mullen, a writer, folklorist, museum consultant, lecturer whose work focuses on race. Art, history, and politics. Welcome to Politics in Black. Welcome, Miss Mullen. Welcome. So I think we want to dive right in Friday because I know you, we, we've read your book, um, Dr. Darity, Ms. Mullen, we've read your book and you know how I feel about it. I feel like it is the definitive guide for reparations. You, you laid out a roadmap of actionable items and, and a, a real pathway to get us to economic justice here for the, the, the black persons of those descended out of those enslaved in the U.S., so I've, I've heard you already on the road kind of walking people through the book as you do this book tour and reading different passages that illuminate and, and undergird the case for reparations. So I really, we, we just want to give you space to do that here today. So again, welcome, and I'm going to turn the floor over to you so you can take us through this incredible work you put together. Well, that's great. Uh, I think we'd like to focus today on a variety of 
misconceptions, Absolutely. misinformation. Lots of lies. misinformation. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and uh, my, my life partner is going to start the process. So thank man. you all so much for hosting us. We're <laughs> delighted to be here uh, and to to, uh, to to be with you uh, and, and to celebrate this this day with um, eight of Los Angeles. So I want to focus on two chief misperceptions uh, about slavery. Uh, and you know, people will say sometimes people will say, "Well, you know, my family had no connection to to the institution of slavery. Um, we didn't own any slaves." Um, or we were from Maine, you know, or from, you know, we were from Wisconsin. Um, you know, there were no enslaved, you know, people in those states, they might say. Or we came, uh, you know, my ancestors were immigrants to the United States and they came after, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the antebellum period. And so to, we, we talk about, we, you know, these kinds of, um, these kinds of cases, these kind of rationales that people bring to disconnect, disassociate themselves from slavery, but also the legacy of slavery. So I want to say, first of all, um, this notion that only a small fraction of whites owned slaves. Um, many people think that 3% or less of white people owned uh, and enslaved black people in the country. Um, or they say that the slave trade and ownership and management of coerced black men, women, and children um, were confined to small numbers of the white population. So this absolutely is not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in fact, the ownership numbers are much higher, especially in the South. Uh, but across the country, uh, our research uh, demonstrates that 8% of all American families own at least one black body. One body. Uh, in the Southern states, uh, the states that seceded from the Union, the percentage was significantly higher. So uh, I'm going to read uh, from, from Here to Equality reparations from, uh, for Black Americans in the 21st century. This is page 66 for those of you who are following along here on this question. And we write, um, in 1860, at the national level, approximately 8% of all American families owned at least one slave. But this seemingly low aggregate national percentage was influenced heavily by the 21 non-Southern states where no families owned slaves during the last days of the antebellum period. By 1860, the Southern experience with slaveholding stood in marked contrast with the Northern pattern. Among the 11 states that seceded from the Union in 1861 to establish the Confederacy, that would be Arkansas, Tennessee, Virginia, North Carolina, Texas, and Louisiana, registered at the lowest, lower end with at least 20% of white families owning slaves. Um, so those percentages are 20, 25, 26, 28, 28, and 29 percent, respectively. The remaining five states all registered proportions of 34 percent or higher, peaking at staggering rates of 46 and 49 percent in South Carolina and Mississippi, respectively. A still more dramatic indicator of the scope of white engagement with slave ownership is the proportion of white people who were members of slaveholding families. While the national figure was 13% in 1860, one quarter of whites in Arkansas and Tennessee lived in families that owned at least one slave. Mm. In Texas, Virginia, and North Carolina, at least one third of whites lived in slave owning families. This proportion rose well above 40% in Florida, Georgia, Alabama, and Louisiana, cresting at a fantastic 55 and 57% in Mississippi and South Carolina, respectively. Um, so uh, the second point is, you know, that slave owners and non-slave owners alike were intimately connected to the system. Uh, its economic power was felt in the North, it was felt in the South mm -hmm. and across the globe. Uh, incidentally, um, Northern economics, uh, nor Northern economies also benefited greatly from the slave trade uh, and the labors of coerced blacks. Um, New England in particular uh, had this you know, incredible uh, textile industry um, that, I mean, cotton was king. You know, cotton was uh, king, not just in the South, but also in the, in the North. And, you know, Wall Street um, and the stock market both were fueled by this enormous profit that was made from cotton. It was, in fact, uh, a multifaceted economy. Mm -hmm. um, I want to speak to a second point that um, 
you know, many critics of reparations make, which is that slavery was so long ago. Yeah. You know, there's no reason to keep bringing it up. All right. So, yes, yeah, slavery was outlawed 156 years ago. But one of the last known people to have been forced to live as a slave, a man named Oluwale Kosola, who came to be known as Kujo Lewis, was alive in 1935. Wow. Okay? Yeah. Both of my parents could have known him. Right. So how did this happen? In 1860, 50 years after it was illegal to import slaves to the United States, Kujo Lewis was one of 120 natives of Dahomey, present-day Benin, in West Africa, who were smuggled into the country on a ship called the Clotilda and sold into slavery in Alabama. Um, some of you all may recall anthropologist Sorrel Neil Hurston um, met and interviewed Lewis in 1927 uh, her biography, Barracoon, The Story of the Last Black Cargo, was published in 2018. Uh, but another captive from Dahomey, uh, who was also on that ship and sold in Alabama, a woman who was called Ridoshi, R-E-D-O-S-H-I, uh, was later known as Sally Smith, died in 1937. Okay. So another way to look at distance, uh, at the distance we are from slavery, is generationally. Um, Hortense McClinton, who we met in 2014, is a daughter of an enslaved person. And uh, so the story she shared with us begins with her father. And I'm going to go back again to uh, from here to equality. And now I'm reading from page 241. Right. So this is someone who's who is very close uh, to um, uh, the slavery period. So so Sabrone. Jones King, a man with a prodigious intellect and a keen survival instinct, emerged from the shadow of slavery only to find that his successful lumber business made him a target for whites who resented his propensity, I'm sorry, who, resent, who resented his prosperity and tried to thwart him at every turn. I remember that story. <laughs> yeah. When a white railroad station dispatcher in Kilgore, Texas, refused to allow King's hired hands to load his milled timber onto the train for delivery to a buyer in 1924, King confronted the dispatcher. The man argued and the dispatcher told King he would kill him if he continued to press his case. King is said to have replied, well, you better kill me quick, because if you don't, I'll shoot and I'll kill you before I hit the ground. So the dispatcher did not act on his threat. <laughs> Born in East Texas on January 14, 1865, about 150 years ago, nearly a year before slavery was declared illegal in December 1865, with the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, King conferred with his parents and siblings after the altercation with the dispatcher. He decided his best option was to pull up stakes and move his young family to Bowley, Oklahoma, one of the state's all-Black towns. King's daughter, Hortense McClinton, was five years old when the family moved to Bowley. In 1966, McClinton became the first black faculty member hired by the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She taught in the School of Social Work. Vigorous, lively, and vital at 101 years of age, she recently urged us to finish this book, McClinton, the Daughter of a Slave, is One Generation Removed from Slavery. So this was um, three years ago. So we, we actually um, had an opportunity to visit with Ms. Clinton, McClinton uh, last year. Okay. And, uh, she, and she has a copy of From Here to Equality. And I was you know, <laughs> delighted to, 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 to know That's that wonderful. her family story yeah. um, is included here. But yes, when, you look, when you're thinking about slavery from a generational perspective, um, it's not that long ago. Not, not that long ago. And one so, of the other things I heard- The you legacy, can, okay. and certainly no. the legacy of slavery is something that we're still feeling today. Yeah, I, I wanna emphasize that, uh, that the case that we build in From Here to Equality is not restricted to so-called slavery Correct. reparations in the first place. Yes. Uh, our premise is that there's a series of atrocities that have been inflicted on black Americans that have affected their economic status. Uh, so we, we begin with slavery, uh, but then we move into the post-slavery era where the first atrocity is the failure to provide the formerly enslaved with any form of restitution. They were promised 40-acre uh, land grants. Uh, those were never given. 
there was a process that was undertaken at the beginning of uh, 1860, of January 1865, where some of the folks who were uh, who had been formerly enslaved and who had emancipated themselves and joined the Union Army were given plots of land. About 40,000 persons were settled on 400,000 acres of land. Uh, but that was temporary mm -hmm. because Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's successor, reversed this process of the provision of restitution in the form of land and restored the land that had been given out at that point to the former slaveholders. Uh, initially, Sherman's special order number 15 designated approximately 5.3 million acres of land for the formerly enslaved. And if 40 acres had been delivered to all of the formerly enslaved in the same proportions as the initial allotment, it would have amounted to 40 million acres of land. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, uh, at the same time that the, uh, the formerly enslaved were denied any form of restitution, the United States government used the Homestead Act of 1862 to provide 160 acre grants of land to white Americans in the Western territories that had been appropriated from uh, the Native American population. Uh, these 160 acre land grants, I guess, amounted to approximately 280 million acres of land. In total. Million. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you were saying the other day that uh, this would constitute the equivalent of the land area of California and Texas combined. Wow. At the locations, land grant was... Um, uh, Trina Williams. Trina Williams has estimated that anywhere from 45 to 90 million living white Americans are beneficiaries of the intergenerational effects of those land grants. So this is... a Literally, this is a, a national handout yes. to white Americans yes. uh, of the ultimate sort. Mm -hmm. So uh, so that's one atrocity that occurs in the post-slavery period. The second atrocity, of course, has to be the wave of massacres that decimated black communities that had developed some measure of prosperity. And not only did it result in land, lives lost, but it resulted in the destruction of black property or the seizure of black property by whites. Uh, and then we also have the lynching trail, yes. which was also frequently associated with the taking of property from the individuals who were murdered. And now we come into the 20th century where the focus of wealth accumulation centers on home equity and mm -hmm. home buying. And we find that there's a series of policies that get implemented that favor whites and disadvantage blacks, as, as usual. Mm -hmm. uh, the first set of policies are associated with the existence of restrictive covenants. Then when the Supreme Court finally de dictates that restrictive covenants are no longer legal, the, uh, the process of redlining kicks in. Mm -hmm. And in the aftermath of World War II, when the United States adopts the GI Bill, on behalf of returning veterans. It's adopted in such a way that, uh, that it's discriminatory in its application. It's, uh, it's set up so that local governments, particularly throughout the South, had complete discretion over whom would receive the benefits of the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. And so in the extreme, I think in the state of Mississippi, two black returning veterans received any kinds of benefits from the home buying provisions. And, and that, was out, that was out of thousands, correct, Dr. Derrida? That was out of thousands, wow. yeah. yeah. And so, so and, and, and you could extrapolate, extrapolate that to the, other, to the rest of the, uh, the southern states where the proportions were extremely low. And they were very low in northern states like New York and New Jersey as well I in terms of uh, the provisions for black, uh, for black veterans. Yeah, so, speaking of New York and New Jersey, just quickly, I, yeah. I recently read that um, returning veterans built approximately 60,000 or so homes based on GI benefits that they received. And of those, less than 100 were ADOS or descendants of persons enslaved here in the U.S. Are, have you heard that same statistic? Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, you can you can find this detailed in Ira Katz Nelson's book. Yes. When affirmative action was white. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but we we've been arguing that in the aftermath of this that that slavery itself was white affirmative action, mm. and that uh, in the mm. aftermath of the Civil War. The provision of these 160 acre land grants to large numbers of whites is white affirmative action. So 
uh, Katz Nelson is focused on the 20th century and uh, and the way in which whites had benefited from government largesse in the context of uh, home buying. But, mm -hmm. but the process of white affirmative action has a much longer history in the United States. Absolutely. So, uh, so then what we argue is that these public policies have resulted in this immense racial wealth gap uh, of a magnitude where 13% of blacks uh, are, 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 are members of the US population, but only uh, but blacks only hold about 2.6% of the nation's wealth. And I think this is a statistic that I, I first heard about from from uh, from Antonio Moore uh, and went back and investigated. And it's it's mm -hmm. it's, it's exactly accurate. Absolutely. Uh, and what it means is that the average black household in the United States has eight hundred thousand dollars less in net worth than the average white household. Uh, and so I'd like to share something a bit more here that's related to that observation. Please. Uh, in From Here to Equality, we say that you have to eliminate the racial wealth gap as a central objective of a reparations plan, uh, a, a reparations plan for black American descendants of U.S. slavery specifically. Uh, and so uh, we say in a, a report that we just did for the Roosevelt Institute, to eliminate the racial wealth gap in its entirety, it is essential that the mean gap be erased rather than setting far, a far less ambitious goal, such as closing the gap at the black-white median differential. Although the usual discussion of wealth gaps focuses on median differences, because the median captures the typical condition for American households, targeting the median will leave the racial wealth gap largely untouched. The fact that 97% of white wealth is held by households with a net worth above the white median, $171,000, makes any policy that seeks to close the racial gap at the median a policy that discounts overwhelmingly the largest proportion of racial wealth inequality. Uh, and indeed, this is reinforced by the fact that while 25% of white households have a net worth in excess of $1 million. It is only 4% of black households in wow. the United mm -hmm. States. And so to close that gap would require an allocation of funds that would at least amount to 10 to $12 trillion. And that's what we think should be one of the central objectives of, uh, of, of, of a black reparations project. Absolutely. Well, one of the other uh, critiques that we that we hear often is that reparations demean the memory of the victims who cannot speak for themselves. Right. So we actually know a, a great deal about what the formerly enslaved wanted from the federal government. Right. In January 1865, before the Civil War ended, um, General William Sherman and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton traveled to Savannah, Georgia, mm -hmm. to meet with 20 black ministers to ask that very thing, you know, what do the freedmen want? Um, the group asked Reverend Garrison Frazier of North Carolina to represent them. And I'm gonna read from, from Here to Equality, this is page 157. And let's see what we learned. Um, so for more than a hundred, let me back up. So more than a hundred, so, so this is this is kind of you know where the folklorist uh, in me really starts to 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 get excited. I mean, we have a, a, a saying. I have a saying that you know black folklore is essentially true. You know there may be some part some you know some points around the edges that need tweaking, but but the stories that have been passed down uh, in black families are for the most part. Yeah. Are she, very accurate. She tells me I'm crazy for this, but I actually believe some people did fly back to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Believed until proven otherwise. <laughs> so, um, so Sherman's plan had begun to take shape in January 1865, uh, three months before the final battle of the Civil War was fought, when he and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, who I mentioned, meet in Savannah, Georgia, with 20 black leaders, ministers, and church officers primarily to discuss the plight of the state's freedmen. The leaders selected former slave in Granville County, North Carolina native, Reverend Garrison Fraser, he's 67 years old, minister for 35 years to be their spokesperson. 
He had managed to purchase his and his wife's freedom eight years earlier with $1,000 in silver and gold. When asked to define the institution of slavery and state his understanding of the Emancipation Proclamation that President Lincoln had issued January 1st, 1863, Reverend Frazier replied, slavery is receiving by irresistible power the work of another man and not by his consent. The freedom, as I understand it, promised by the proclamation is taking us from under the yoke of bondage and placing us where we could reap the fruit of our own labor, take care of ourselves and assist the government in maintaining our freedom. When asked how the freedmen proposed to provide a livelihood for themselves, Reverend Frazier responded, the way we can best take care of ourselves is to have land and turn it and till it by our own labor that is by the labor of the women and children and old men, and we can soon maintain ourselves and have something to spare. And to assist the government, the young men would enlist in the service of the government and serve in such manner as they may be wanted. We want to be placed on land until we are able to buy it and make it our own. So when asked if he preferred to live among whites or solely among blacks, Reverend Frazier indicated that while he could not speak for the other ministers, he preferred to live among Blacks. Quote, for there is a prejudice against us in the South that will take years to get over. Mm -hmm. um, so when question, so it's interesting that he was thinking, you know, we need land. He wasn't talking about, you know, other kinds of assets. Um, he knew that this was an essential, an essential asset mm -hmm. that uh, the Blacks would need in order to get themselves um, settled, established, and to begin this new life as free people. Mm -hmm. um, so soon after the meeting with these ministers, um, General Sherman's special field orders, number 15, was disseminated. Uh, and this is a directive that authorized the redistribution of the balance of land confiscated from and abandoned by the fleeing Confederates who'd raised arms against the North. So you're talking about a 30-mile band of land stretching from the South uh, Carolina Sea Islands to Florida in 40 acre tracks. So uh, the federal government's unfulfilled promise of these land grants to those formerly enslaved people is the basis of today's racial wealth gap. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the giants who has been chronicling the reparations movement, historian Mary, Mary Frances Berry, wrote a biography of Callie House. So House was born enslaved in Tennessee, mother of five and a widow, who laundered clothes and linens to support her family House fought for reparations for emancipated Blacks and then petitioned for pensions for Black Civil War veterans. So, you know, these were the kinds of payments that loyal American citizens could expect, right? So why not loyal, newly emancipated Black people? Mm -hmm, you know, absolutely. To fought to save the Union. So House was aware that at least $68 million in back taxes was owed by the Confederates on abandoned cotton these are bales of cotton that were stockpiled in warehouses or still in the ground. Uh, and House recommended that the money be used to provide black reparations. So the book's title, My Face is Black is True, comes from House herself, who said in 1899, my face is black is true, but it's not my fault. But I love my name and my honest dealing with my fellow man. So Cal Callie House's efforts um, you know, led to her chartering, uh, 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 she and uh, uh, a, a co frere chartered the National Ex-Slave Mutual Relief Bounty and Pension Association in 1898. They eventually recruit 300,000 members. Um, but uh, interestingly, they got a lot of negative reaction from members of the Black elite, I and mean, it was quite striking. Um, so today we see some of these same problems, you know, some among the black elite are advocating the fund should be funneled into black American or African businesses or to all Americans of African descent. Mm. But we believe that the bulk of any reparations funds, at least 70 percent, should be given to living black American descendants of U.S. slavery. Yes. These are folks whose ancestors were denied that 40 acre stake yes. in this country. And they are the, the they are the righteous recipients of any reparations program in the U.S. So yeah, I would say that the internal uh, antagonism in the black community that was directed at Callie House's efforts 
strongly resembles Today. the kind of resistance that the ADOS movement has Absolutely. received from some segments. Of I, it. I would I would 100% agree, agree with that. Yeah. Um, and since we're talking about recipients, I know that you've put forward criteria to identify who would be eligible for reparations. How, how, how could you talk to that criteria quickly? So there, there are two there are two criteria that we um, that we establish. One is a lineage criteria criteria, and the other is an identity criteria mm. criteria. So an individual would have to prove that they were descended from at least one uh, uh, black enslaved person who was enslaved in the U.S. Uh, one black descendant of U.S. slavery, basically. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, and then the identity standard is that at least 12 years before the onset of either a reparations program or a study commission uh, to focus on reparations, that individual would also have had to self-identify as black, African-American, or Negro. Gotcha. So those gotcha. are the two. Gotcha. Gotcha. Can we uh, hop in a little bit um, and talk a little bit about HR 40 and the um, entry that you gave, the, the presentation that you gave uh, to the judiciary uh, during the hearing last year, 2019, um, on Juneteenth of all days, um, that's when the HR 40 hearing was. Dr. Darity, can you just speak to some of the recommendations that you made and some of the issues that you had with the current language of HR 40? And and has anybody called you about it? <laughs> from, from where? <laughs> Dr. Sheila's office. I'll take office, that as a no. The, the CBC, no. <laughs> But can you speak um, to that? But it, it, you know, one of the things that's really interesting is the fact that when the hearing was held in June a year ago, um, I think my testimony was the only testimony that involved a discussion or dissection of the legislation itself. Even though the hearing was called to be on H.R. 40, I think that virtually everybody else who testified talked about whether they thought reparations was a good idea or a bad idea, mm -hmm. but I don't believe anyone else actually talked about the substance of the legislation yes. itself. Yes. The second thing I'd like to say is that there's been a superb dissection of HR 40 that's been conducted by the brothers on the Be the Power Absolutely. Podcast. Shout out BTP. I, I, I urge people to, to listen to that. It was, was excellent. It was excellent. Absolutely. I agree. Um, so there's a lot of overlap between the kinds of criticisms that they raise and the concerns that I have raised. But let, let me highlight uh, let me highlight several of them. Uh, the, the first I'd like to highlight concerns the actual structure and incentives that are built into the legislation. Now I'm very concerned that we have a piece of legislation that would pay the 13 commissioners salaries at the GS18 level. Mm -hmm. DS-18 is actually above the standard threshold for civil service salaries and would permit people to be paid somewhere in the vicinity of $200,000 per annum. Okay. Now, that would be one thing if the commission had a deadline built in for delivering a report for its case for reparations and its plan for reparations to Congress. But the legislation only says that the commission must make some type of a report to Congress at the end of a year, and it could continue its operations yeah. indefinitely. It's too open-ended, too open-ended, yeah. Too open-ended, and it's providing people with an incentive for the commission to go on indefinitely as well because of the salaries that they could receive. In addition, the existing legislation has provisions for the members of the commission to contract out services to whomever they please. And those services presumably would be, uh, would be designed or would be intended to serve the purposes of the commission. But, uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's entirely arbitrary at mm -hmm. the discretion of the commission. So there's a sense in which this is, becomes, has some of the character of a slush fund. Yeah. Yeah. Or an operation that really is, as I've said in other places, a sacred mission. Yes. It yes. should not be corrupted in that way. Uh, in addition, we think, and I think, uh, you know, Kirsten and I've talked about this at length, we think that the legislation should specify that 
the laws or or actions that are proposed for Congress to undertake by the commission should specify that black American descendants of U.S. slavery must be the recipients of the reparations project and that the reparations project must do so by providing direct payments to that eligible community and also by eliminating racial wealth differences in the United States. Mm -hmm. So that the commission should be directed to design a proposal that will accomplish those three objectives. Uh, the final thing that I'd like to mention at this point is Please. that the commission's legislation is written to specify that the atrocities that are relevant for the case for reparations begins in 1619. Yeah. And, and while I think 1619 has some symbolic relevance because ostensibly that's when mm -hmm. The first enslaved black people were landed, although we're not sure they really were slaves in the sense that developed subsequently in Virginia. Or the but, first African Or the first to be landed here. Yeah. 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 These, but let's say 1619 has a certain symbolic yeah. relevance. No country. The problem <laughs> is the United States did not exist Correct. in 1619. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, le the legislation H.R. 40 should specify that the relevant period for attention is from 1776 to the present, not 1619. And and I, I'll assure you, there's a sufficient number of atrocities that took place since 1776 <laughs> yeah. that we don't have to worry about that earlier period. Yeah, absolutely, no. I, I hear you 100%, Dr. Darity. I, unfortunately, I'm getting the signal that we're out of time. Okay. I, I, we have so much more to talk to you about. Kirsten, Dr. Darity, I, I wanted to get into deconfederization uh, and several other points. Evaluation. Yeah, several other points. Please, please come back. And we're, we're going to extend again because we want to continue this conversation with you. Um, you. You two have done work that is so important to us and undergirds all that we're doing in ADOS and our movement and informs us. Please continue to your tireless advocacy. Yeah. I know I'm appreciative. My family is appreciative. My my progeny is appreciative, and everyone in the you know in the Adolf's <laughs> movement is appreciative. So, thank you. Thank I'm you sorry we're, so we much. ran out of time, uh, but girl. thank you both. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll be glad to come back and talk to you uh, to Chad and and Friday Absolutely. at any time. Look out for that Thanks invite. So that it's invite coming. is coming. Yeah. All, the best. <laughs> All the best to you. Thank you. Thank you. That just goes too quickly, fam. It, it really always does. does. It always does. And, and we extended this show. This is a special for you guys out there today. That flew. That flew. And we got we got to go to a break now, fam. Uh, get a, get set up for the next se segment. You so know who's coming up. Make a bathroom run. Yeah, make a bathroom run. <laughs> Come back. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Politics in Black.
<laughs> What's up, fam? We are back for more Politics in Black. Before we bring our next two guests on, we wanted to quickly do a promo about ACA5, which is now called Prop 16 in the state Woo-hoo. of California. So ADOS fam and allies in California, pay attention. Proposition, Proposition 16 will be on your November ballot, and if passed, would amend the state's constitution to repeal Proposition 209, which effectively banned affirmative action policies in the state for the past 25 years. By all measured data, Prop 209 has limited and negatively impacted AOS employment, education, and business opportunities in the state of California. ADO's chapters in California have been working closely with State Assembly member Dr. Shirley Weber, chairwoman of the Legislative Black Caucus and principal sponsor of Prop 16, to ensure this important ballot measure is supported and ratified in November. Come Election Day, vote yes on Prop 16 and restore state policies that directly benefit ADOS and ADOS communities in California. Again, that's yes on 16. Yes on 16, y'all. So, All right. So go. we're getting right into, um, for us, it's a special privilege to have what we call the dynamic duo here. We have uh, Antonio Moore and Yvette Cardinal, the founders of the ADOS hashtag and the, yes. the creators of this ADOS movement. They really birthed uh, this next civil rights movement, and we've not seen anything like it. Um, since Dr. Close. Martin Luther King's uh, era. Yep. Uh, multi-na- multi-state, across the nation, uh, chapters everywhere. Uh, the work that they are doing is really like uh, presenting history live. We are living through history that will be written about. Uh, Antonio Moore graduated from UCLA and Loyola Law School. He's now practicing a Los Angeles-based attorney. Moore hosts a weekly radio show known as Tone Talks. In recent years, he worked as a producer on the Emmy-nominated documentary entitled Crack in the System, presented by Al Jazeera. It tells the story of the effects of mass incarceration, the Iran-Contra, um, the Iran-Contra, I want to say there's another word there, and the resulting crack cocaine epidemic that swept across uh, America. So we want to bring in Mr. Antonio Moore. Welcome to the show, Tone. Hey, what's up with y'all? Doing great, man. Doing great. Thank you for being here today. And hey, what's up? I'm going to in- introduce the second part of the dynamic duo. Yvette Carnell writes about politics, wealth, and race. She is the founder of the Breaking Brown Political Show, where hundreds of thousands of viewers around the world congregate twice weekly to receive a master class level political education. Prior to embarking on a career in news media, she served as a congressional aide, first to Senator Barbara Boxer, and later to former Congressman Robert Marion Barry. She received her BA in political science from Howard University, Woo-hoo! and her writing has been featured by national news outlets, including but not limited to The Nation, The Garden, Guardian, Politico, and NPR. Alongside Antonio Moore, she co-founded the grassroots ADOS political movement that advocates for lineage-based reparations and a targeted black agenda to collectively uplift 32 million descendants of black persons enslaved in the U.S. She is a generational thought leader and and the indomitable driving force behind the most effective and energetic movement for black American ADOS equity and opportunity since the assassination of MLK. So please, family, welcome Yvette Carnell to the show. All right, we're bringing Yvette in, but Tone, you know, um, a lot of people don't know how you and Yvette came together. You both have uh, over, I want to say, 150,000 followers um, on YouTube collectively. And growing. And growing uh, every day. How is it that you two even became familiar with each other and started your work? Uh, just essentially through videos um, and then reaching out across the country. Um, I really enjoyed her, her earlier uh, content, particularly the piece she did on Obama. She called out Obama not being uh, African-American well before everyone else. I, I basically have believed that since Election Day 08. Um, so from there, we just created a synergy. Awesome. And Yvette, we're going to we're going to pull you in here fast. We saw you pop up right on cue. Welcome, welcome, right on cue. Welcome, fam. <laughs> welcome to the show. Um, in terms of, of uh, ADOS, that is such specific language. And when you and Tone were working together, how many different 
it iterations of, yeah. of trying to come to something that has specific specificity um so that we know like you know we say negroes when we know if you say negro we, we know what you're talking <laughs> you about, talking about? In, in, talking in the to? black community yeah. we know who you're talking to but how did you all come up with su- something so perfect so that we could start using that language in terms of self-identification well no it was it was actually kind of in the sense of it was guess and check because i don't know if everybody remembers but initially it was it was it was DOS, right? But then you had to put the American because it has to be anchored in Americanness or it doesn't work. So that was kind of a you just have to kind of figure it out as you go and see what resonates with people in terms of that language and understanding. But it had to be coupled right with the understanding of who we are. And so it it actually has a strong sound to it too because it has to be strong. So it's ADOS. Yeah. You know that sounds like ADOS. It doesn't sound like it's, it's not a kind of weak kind of acronym or whatever. So it just kind of came together like that though. But it has to say it has to say what we are American descendants of slavery as the institution. Short mm-hmm. and sweet to the point. That's just what it was. I love that. Perfect. And, and Tone, I, I want to come to you because I think it's very interesting that you're a trained attorney, but you have turned into this data detective now. Where you're, really? where you're telling the story of ADOS through data, which is something I, I'd never seen before. I don't think it's ever been done before. And by doing so, you have kind of stripped all the illusions, all of the, all of the veil, the decadent veil off, and gone straight into the reality. So can you talk a little bit about how you got to the point from you know, being legally trained to now being this kind of data analyst and scientist? Researcher, yeah. Researcher? Um. I don't necessarily think of myself so much as a as a researcher in the sense that many of the uh, this much of this information isn't beyond like the first level of a lot of these economic sites. We see some mm-hmm. of the ADOS people now taking on their own like train of thought to look into things. Shout out to Serena um, and several others that I've seen pull data and see things. I just think that we haven't uh, like really lived this full of, full participants in america i'm not gonna say adults and i'll be disrespectful this is normal like that's why they put the data out and like i i don't i don't really know if if our people were not looking at basic components of neighborhoods and cities and and national realities of wealth because they didn't want to see the truth Mm -hmm. or because they just were just so unaware of what you're supposed to be doing as an adult and so you know I was I was talking to Thomas Shapiro about some of his work. And in his work, you know, he tended to look at, at cities for like decades. Like one of the studies he followed a small cohort for 40 years um, of, of basically from, I think it was in Baltimore from children to adults. I don't do that. Um, and then it's interesting to look at stuff like what we saw out of Alicia Garza and BLM with their very odd study where they don't even understand how to do a study where they just, decided what they were going to do with their sample. The trans were going to be overrepresented. And I, I don't know. It just feels like what happened was we don't understand that if you don't do the data part, you really can't do the rest. We saw that yeah. recently. And I just had this thing go on on my Twitter yesterday where we had a black female payday. But now we find out from the New York Times, as I asserted when the black female payday happened, when you add in the prisoners who make $2 an hour, black men make 51 cents on the dollar to white men, which means that you just have a black payday. Mm-hmm. You, it's not on me to actually do that work. It's on the person that created black female payday because you actually have to make the less recording than black has men. stopped. My recording stopped. Uh, y'all still hear me? I yeah, we still got you, Tom. Oh, I said recording stopped on, on my end. Um, and so uh, I, I don't know. I just feel like in some ways it's, it's less about me being a data detective as much to just try to show ADOS this is what life looks like. Now we Tell come the to story. the reality of what it means mm-hmm. once you know the data. It means I, that I think, you might not have enough. Yeah. I think what you were able to do though, Tone, was to show us how the data relates to us. Tells the story. How how the story yeah. reflects us. And I think that when you when we have conversations about the abilities and the deficiencies in mainstream media, I think you were able to break through where mainstream media is not because they could give they could take the same story and spin it in a way that doesn't feel like it's relevant to us or our lives and i think that that's like a skill and that skill belongs to you and luckily it belongs now to ados and the movement because it wasn't there before you that's for sure Mm -hmm. 
No, thank you. Thank you for doing that, Tone. And um, Yvette, I wanted to come to you real quick because one of the things that I saw happen just in my involvement is that, you know, shortly after ADOS sort of took off in social media, there was a swarm of disinformation and attacks that appeared to be launched, you know, from all different angles. I from mean, everybody. They, they, you know, and, and since you stood strong, they were coming at you personally. I mean, we were called MAGA, we were called Russian bots, we were called xenophobic, divisive, everything under the sun. Um, I, I, we from your called anti-black. Anti-black, right. <laughs> from your perspective, did you expect that type of reaction from from you know the establishment and mainstream media? Was Joy that Reed, was that something when Shuri you guys were Mitchell. sitting around and and talking about Ados and the project? Did you say like you know everybody's gonna come for us? Well, you know what? You know I expected attacks. I didn't expect the attacks to be so personal. Yeah. And I didn't expect the attacks to be so orchestrated. Yeah. So so that's kind of what surprised me in terms of you could see the orchestration of the attack. So, right, even even now you kind of see that. You kind of see, you know, Nicole Hannah-Jones retweet Joy Reid, even with Joy Reid having that smear, and you see, like, oh, this is still just this coordinated attack amongst the, like, chattering class of Negroes who have decided that their bread and butter is, is on, like, racial conversation. Their bread and butter is not racial solution. So they're going to come and they're going to keep coming. I didn't expect it to be as orchestrated. I thought they were going to come. And I didn't expect it to be like this, this, this event is X, Y, and Z, and we're just going to keep digging into her and digging into her and trying to figure out something and doing personal, taking personal pot shots. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that as much. Um, but it is what it is. Like when you're in a fight, you can't be like, well, I didn't expect you yeah. to punch so hard. You hit me. And you're <laughs> you get, you get hit, you better throw a punch. Yeah. yeah, you in here now. Or as we say, throw a yeah. chair. Yeah, we, you in here. We yeah, throw you know, a chair. You <laughs> ain't, no rules to, ain't no rules to fight in the way these people fight, right? No. So I think. And I think that's something that, like, you know, that we had to kind of bring ADOS along with. Like, you, there is no soft way to kind of have this fight because they're not going to fight soft. And mm -hmm. then they're going to tell you, well, it's not me. It's 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 event. And and and, and then Tom says something. That it's them. And it's like, no, it's you. It's always been you. And there is no way to kind of like talk nice to you because that's just something that you say. You're never going to be nice to us. You're never going to talk nice to us because your bread and butter is on kind of getting in front of the wave that we have and making it beneficial to you in a way that you can monetize it. But it's never about real solutions because that causes real divisiveness. That make, that means real exclusions. That means you really have to face white supremacy. And we all know that you don't have the heart to do it. Mm -hmm. And we Facts. saw we saw that on um, the NAACP with Ed, what's his last name? Ed Brown, I think his name is, the, the old school. He, Ed Gordon, there mm -hmm. we go. My brain works some days. Um, but with Ed Gordon and the exchange when ADOS were on their Facebook Live and, you know, this was supposed to be a conversation, but we were asking for solutions. And, I mean, he had to actually admit uh, during that session on Facebook that, that that wasn't even their purpose. And so it kind of becomes like if that's not the purpose, we are beyond the point of just talking about it. And I think one thing that you all have been very instrumental in is activating uh, ADOS Absolutely. individuals and activating us to action. Absolutely. And so for, for us to be in a conversation that's not action oriented, it doesn't even feel right to us. Um, anymore at this point. So thanks for that, because that wouldn't have happened again um, without mm, you two I, planting those seeds there. Mm -hmm. Can I also join in on that point? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's also interesting to contrast Yvette and Joy Reid, because I think that, you know, when you go into that question, you have, did you expect, I just expected like honesty. So like Joy Reid is this this woman who her, her both her sides of her family, Congolese, Guyanese together have 200,000 people in America. She has this history of, in college, being conservative, conservative, speaking about negatively about, about uh, gay people and the like. And then you have Yvette on the other side who worked for the DNC, worked for con the, uh, Democratic Congressional Aides, and then she wore a prop hat during the show, and all of a sudden the prop hat is the picture for every show, even though she's had, you know, uh, I think it's like 500 shows or 400 shows, whatever number she has up there. And no, and there's no hat in any of the other shows. Mm -hmm. So you had this dishonesty. And I don't know if the group actually understands when the event says you're in a fight that you don't go back and like, like kind of tiptoe with that kind of person because there's something else going on. 
So I also didn't didn't expect us to have to deal with. See, we're dealing with people that are highly tribal and also come from like places that have scarcity at levels that we maybe ne don't necessarily understand. And their their whole anchoring is different than ours. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that one of the things that ADOS has kind of like brought about is a question of what happens next if you don't become aware. Because I always use the example, like you can take a black barber from Los Angeles and he can go cut hair during, even during the breaking COVID, like no, meaning there's less customers and everything. And there's not going to be like this tribalistic get out of my barber shop if you go to Philly right now. Right. These are people who come out of a very, very tribalistic kind of model. And I don't know how much this is aware. You have Joy Reid tomorrow night starting a show as the first black woman in American history to have a, a cable nighttime TV show. That's why? Yeah. By what right? Yeah. You have Kamala Harris, who went to high school in Canada, raised by an Indian mother. The dad is Jamaican. We're not sure if he's Indio Jamaican, but we can't even ask that. But the Indians can ask uh, Elizabeth Warren if she's Indian. But then it, on top of it, what we definitely know, she's not ADOS. So this means that the vice president and the president, if they become black people over the course of the last 10 years, weren't ADOS. Mm -hmm. And nobody's saying anything. Yeah. And I didn't expect ADOS to be so unaware and act like as we thought about this discussion. Well, because I kind of get this from people. Well, you know, we got to get used to this. Well, this is your whole life. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and I don't know how to tell you to get used to you come from a slave and Jim Crow. And that's why you don't have enough wealth to be here. But you got to move faster than this. Yeah. And we have to get comfortable with it. I um, sit in on uh, L.A. County's Democratic County Committee, which is the largest Democratic County Committee in the country. And the immigrants in there, they have no problem talking about their history, where they came from, when they were illegal, when they became legal, you know, how they were poor. And I think that part of our socialization in this nation has been one of shame. Be fearful and be shameful. And and we, I think through ADOS and through our ability to speak with each other and based on the, the political education we receive uh, from the two of you, we can say, no, this is my story. Absolutely. This is where they came from. This is what it was. And there's no shame in that. No, you guys have cultivated and curated an army of educated and dang dangerous Negroes. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, and, and, and let me just say one thing. Not only that, it's like you have to wield that lineage as a weapon. Yes. And I'm not talking about like Trump's people came here and they talk about how his, the, he, he came from the immigration and all that stuff. And it's just like, so how can Trump tell me anything and why does Trump have what he has? Yeah. Right. How, how do you like, like you like you just got to come here and be white That's and like like and other people had to come here and do something else. Right. And so it's just like, no, I have to be able like we have kind of pushed ourselves away. From like I don't necessarily want to be American. I've heard people say I'm a soldier of war. I ain't seen you with a gun. You got no machine gun. You ain't got no army. No. <laughs> like understand that you have to be like I'm. I'm, I'm more American than you. Mm -hmm. Like right. I'm more American Claim than you. It. And yep. like my people built the country for free. You don't get the right to even right have an assessment like yeah. about who I am and what I deserve and what I owe. Oh, you just pay your taxes, right? Yeah. It's because this is a debt that's owed when you talk about reparations. And you just I think we have to understand who we are and we can't let anybody like get in front of that because that's how movements get co-opted. And that's why, I, you know, even with, even with, you know, what, what Antonio was talking about, Joy Reid, how she played a role in that, you know, even, even with the back and forth with the Cohen and Jones or whatever, all of that is because people want to get in front of the wave and have the conversation. It's kind of like what you just said about Ed Gordon. You want to have the conversation, but, and you want to make art and help people understand that doesn't help people eat. Like we're at a point right now and coronavirus mm -hmm. really brought it to the front. We're at a point right now, people need wealth. We need yeah. to eat. We need inheritance. These are things that we need to survive. This is not a game anymore. So I don't have time for you to get in front of it and do something with it that's not a solution just so that you can make bank for yourself. This is not an individual project. This is about collective uplift. Yeah. And so when I hear you talking, it sounds a lot about you. When I was talking about Nicole Hannah Jones, one of the problems I also had very early on is that I didn't see a lot of people who were involved in that project mm. with her get to go around and do interviews. Where are your people? What is your uplift? You know, when I see people on YouTube who are ADOS and like even what y'all doing right now, I try to uplift that. I try to retweet it. I want to be there. Where are you? Where do I see you uplifting people from your own project? Mm -hmm. So they are kind of clues to me in terms of who people are and the direction that they're headed. And I just think we have to we have to be able to see that quick. We have to be able to see that quick and move on that quick in terms of our collective self-interest. Yeah. Absolutely. Can you can you pull up that chart one more time? Because you pulled it up twice, and I just want to frame something that we we tend to miss on that chart. 
So this is the Color of Wealth Report of Los Angeles. Uh, Darity did this along with several other economists with UCLA and Duke and the Federal Reserve. Y'all know that Color Wealth, they've done about five cities. This is Los Angeles. We talk a lot about the African black number, which is important. That's the Nigerians primarily. You know, you look at the middle, middle. look at the liquid wealth. I mean, $200 liquid for U.S. black, mm -hmm. uh, 60000 for African blacks. But what we fail to do is contextualize the last number, which is the Asian Indian. So the Asian Indian has $100,000 more in four sixty than the white, which has three fifty five. Just the middle white families worth three fifty, three hundred fifty five thousand dollars in America. I mean, I mean in Los Angeles, and then the middle uh, Asian Indian family is at four sixty. Kamala, this is her family. This is her family. Yeah. Like I, I don't know, I don't know what you guys. What do you do in a world where your your first black president inherited five hundred thousand dollars through his white line? And your possible, most likely, first black VP basically lived as an elite Indian, which outpaced white folks, mm -hmm. and then told you that she's just as black as you because I went to Howard. Yeah. And I, I don't know if everybody understands the context of how this data tells you, you need to really separate from that person. Because that person is basically living off of you and through you, but not doing advocacy for you because they don't need your advocacy. Yeah. And I, I come back. Can you pull the chart back up? Because four hundred sixty thousand dollars, the middle Indian family understand she's Brahmin Indian. But nobody wants to talk about that. They just want to talk about her being black because then that anchors her back into the ADOS like realities of all the costs that you suffer through. What that what that means, understand what I, what this means. Let's go further. That doesn't just mean that her mother had that much wealth. And understand, that's the middle it Indian family. Her mother was a, a professor. Mm -hmm. Understand that. That's not just her mother. That means the auntie, every that means the whole family, the family. was yeah. worth was was worth what only five percent of black families are worth. That's what that means. By what right does this woman have to sit on your lineage? Yeah. And that is the 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 anchoring, I don't know if everybody understands. You can go vote for what you want to, but I'm telling you right now, after the truancy laws and the Mitrice Richardson and, and now the data, you have to start asking yourself, why would I? Yeah. Why would I vote for Kamala? Agreed. And that, you know, that's you're you're talking about something we always hear in terms of immigration. It's like the Democrats kind of want to argue, oh, give us your, you know, your low down trodden, undocumented everybody. And then Republicans tend to be more elitist. They want the high paid tech and STEM workers. But when it comes to legislation, you know, we have asked here in California, um, particularly because Kamala Harris is here, for there to be language changes into these uh, new uh, immigration bills where they want to just take the cap off of the different countries because you're building this pathway specifically for for Indian immigrants to come in on these HB1 visas and, and in the reparations and immigration argument, you know, people will say, oh, so you just want black people to have low paying jobs. And my, my response is, no, I want them to have the high paying jobs, too. But if you're not building a road to Mississippi or a road down to Alabama, where our rural South is the same way you're building a road and inroads into rural India, then wh where is our incentive to compete? And you just don't see it. Mm -hmm. But also to that point, like in a more in a more like large way, being Indian isn't what, what, what's going to get her to presidency. It's being Adolf. Mm -hmm. right? Period. Yeah. Just yep. like Obama. Yep. So like you have somebody who said to the Grio, shout out to them for getting that out of her. I'm not going to do nothing specifically for black people. Turn around and say that she's going to advocate for these HB1 visas, which on its face seems like it's race neutral. But an application drastically impacts her, her, the very same families and neighborhoods that she comes from in, in India. She traveled there regularly. This isn't somebody that's detached from that. She's very much anchored in it. Yeah. Now, in and of itself, nothing wrong with that. But go run on that. Go run on right. that. I, 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 yeah, I think, yeah, I think, I think, I think Antonio's right in the sense of, one of the things we never force people to do is like build your own story. Right. Like, right. Like we have a story that goes back 400 years. Mm -hmm. We have a whole lineage. We have a story. We're anchored here. And so what we kind of had people to do, and that's the, that's, that is the, that is the insidiousness and the awfulness of people of color. We allow you just to shoehorn in on our story and talk about what people of color have done. No, 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 no. This is what ADOS have done. You build your own story. Oh, right. wait a minute. You don't have a story. Well, you can't live off this story. We yeah. need to eat off of this story. And even in terms of what you just said, in terms of 
this this stuff was orchestrated. Remember, the Statue of Liberty was supposed to be for us, right? Yes. After slavery, chains they hit the, they hit them the chains feet. well. Yeah, they chains hit them the chains yeah. real good. So you took you took a, a powerful part of our, that was supposed to be and is part of our story, and you stole it. Mm -hmm. And it's lineage theft. Yeah. You stole it and you made it your story. Now back to what you said about when well, you just want black people to have all the low pay and junk. I want black, I want Adolf to have whatever we want. If, if, if that's how I, I have to eat, right. if, if, if somebody, if, he, if, if that's the only job available, yes, I want I want him to have it, as Amen. opposed to somebody else. Like why wouldn't I want that? If that's the only job available and that's what and he got to eat or she got to eat, an Adolf person, yes, I want you to have opportunities throughout the spectrum, all the way from the bottom to the top. To the top. Yeah, of course, yeah. who wouldn't? Absolutely. Right. And and to get back to the advocacy part of ADOS and what you guys have inspired, because it's absolutely incredible. I mean, you got you know ADOS on the Supreme Court steps in the HR 40 hearing, meeting with their local politicians across the nation. You have inspired the grassroots in a way that I don't think has happened in the last 50, 60 years in this country. And you, what you've also done is you've been able to garner the support of the National Baptist uh, Convention as well, which I don't think has been ha has happened in the last 50, 60 years with mm. any movement. So could you talk a little bit about how that came and shout out Dr. Cosby and St. Stephen's yes, and Simmons Dr. College Cosby. for his, for the great work he's doing. But can you talk a little bit about how you linked with Dr. Cosby and, and were able to garner that endorsement? Well, let Dr. me, let me Cosby, say that, that before, you, before he transitions, I want you to answer that question. But I just want to say one thing. We also did one other thing. Yeah. We exposed the lie. The lie your parents been telling you, the lie boomers as a, as a whole have told us, the lie the Black Caucus told us is that Black young people just didn't get po political. Well, the moment we got political, what we exposed is that they're going to tell us that we xenophobic or that we yeah. uh, just out for ourselves or that we don't understand this. The lie we exposed is that Black politics requires Black people not to be political at this mm. moment. Because what ends up happening is that Black politics ultimately leads to an awareness that it is all about ADOS. Mm -hmm. Black politics is anchored in ADOS. It starts with ADOS. It ends with ADOS. Now, I don't know what the Caribbeans are talking about with their immigration. Nothing wrong with that. But when we're talking about it, we're talking about slavery and Jim Crow. Until you fix reparations, I don't want to hear about immigration. Preach. And exactly. I don't know if, so, if enough, uh, enough black folks mm -hmm. were anchored in that understanding. But if you're not, it's okay. You might not be able to afford your family after COVID. You need to understand that reparations is imperative for you now. It's no longer like what we were saying before five years or something. It's 12 months. Yeah. 12 months. Less than that. And we have to be prepared to say it to other populations. Uh, ADOSLA has no problem saying that locally in resistance to um, our, what's now, uh, what is it, 16? It used to be AB5, now Prop it's 16. Proposition 16. Yep. So go ahead, Yvette. No, I asked a church no, no, question and told us to preach. Dr. Cosby, Dr. Dr. Cosby, Reverend Cosby, he, he reached out to me a few years ago. Um, and and I went there and, and spoke to him and spoke to his congregation because he does something that's really important, you know. One of the things we get into in terms of pastors, though, is like, well, I don't, I'm not, well, I'm not with the church. No more. Yeah, no church is perfect. No pastor is perfect. Nobody is perfect. I'm not perfect. You know, I'm sure none of everybody. But like, you have to. The thing that really got me with Dr. Cosby that he was doing a lot of the same things that I was doing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like political education. Yeah. Right. So he has a he has a he has a book club where he tries to bring people together and they discuss like black books and and stuff like that. So it's just like, wait a minute, you have somebody who's anchored in, in the mm. black church, which is a black institution. Yes. So that's the thing I think we miss is that like people want to people want to run away from black institutions. When I'm talking about ADOS, right, as opposed to taking over the institution. So one of the things I say is that don't do the lazy thing. Like the lazy thing is to be like, I don't do that. I don't go to church. I don't go nowhere. I don't like them. I don't, I don't screw them HBCUs. I don't care. Like, but, but, but th that's all we have. Like that, we don't have anything in terms of, we weren't able to really build wealth and build business. All we have is a little bit of institutional to institutional product that we have right now. And to use that to influence people and to move people to do stuff right. So, you know, he, he reached out to me and then got involved with Antonio too. And so we just started we just started moving in a certain direction in terms of ADOS and what ADOS means. Mm -hmm. And unlike a lot of pastors too, I'll say about Dr. Cosby is that he will listen. I've, I've come across a lot of pastors who are kind of arrogant, you know, and don't really want to be bothered or don't really want to say something that might be controversial. Um, and I think one of the things that was interesting is that I could see what he was trying to do. I, I, I liked his congregation 
and his people and, 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 and the way he walked in like his not in the way he walked around knowledge in terms of what he was trying to do with the school, but also the way he walks um, in terms of his religion, in terms of you, 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 you get to sit back and watch people. He said, okay, he's walking good. Now, mm-hmm. if you stumble, I'm gonna tell you, you stumble, yeah. you know, but you're walking good in terms of and, and better than I see a lot of pastors walk and you're getting political, even if it's controversial, you're getting political. And I think what's happened too much with people of his age is that they have been apolitical and they're not even willing to recognize their failure to do politics. So when you see that, you say, you say, listen, we can work together. This is this is a space where we can do some good for ADOS people. So let's do that. Mm -hmm. And so out of that comes the ADOS conference and everything else. But I think we have to be willing and we got to have some compassion for one another. Right. Yeah. Like. We got to be able to do that. Like, this is Dr. Cosby, this is Yvette, this is Tom, and we're just going to try to figure this thing out. Yeah. It ain't always going to be right. It ain't always going to be perfect, but we're going to try to figure it out because we all, at the end of the day, want the best, want what's best for ADOS. Yes. Right. And one more, and let me add to that point. Um, I'd be remiss not to mention part of the problem with the 1619 Project. Let's talk about it. Uh-oh. Let's go, Tom. Is that, Uh-oh. <laughs> is that Dr. Cosby was talking about Angela in context of 1619, before this, yes. this woman started doing this. Yes. Facts. But it's bigger than that. It wasn't what she did. That's not what the project was. The project was uh, was about bringing about an awakening in the in one of our core institutions, the black church. And basically, okay, so let's back up. You have the Southern Baptist. The Southern Baptist anchored like what the undergirding of what you needed white Southern Baptist of for slavery to actually be justified. You needed to have God ordained it. So Jimmy Carter has a broke has a broken off group of that who who started like they have like two million white Baptists the and they're doing Baptist, progressive yeah. stuff. Yeah. And so what what uh, I believe uh, and what what Dr. Cosby was trying to do was connect them with the National Baptist. Now the National Baptist Convention, these are different conventions when I say this, is the second largest black Baptist convention in America. The first is the progressive Baptist. Mm-hmm. Well, the other thing he was trying to do at the same time was awaken pro- the progressive Baptist convention back up to its original mission because there have been mission drift. Now, mm-hmm. essentially, they are the, the, the undergirding of what of Dr. King, of Martin Luther King. So there was a mission here to take those, the, to, in, to in ignite black America through these black Baptist conventions, the national and the progressive and combine it it, while while being black led with these white Baptists that want to rectify what the Southern Baptists did with the monuments, with slavery and everything else. What the 1619 Project came in and and talked about was the thin ice on top, the plunder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They talked about the history. We had that with Coates. That wasn't what this was though. And so now what you have is you kind of have BLM come in, and we don't know who's behind this thing. I don't want to hear about those three women no more. We don't know who's behind this this whole movement because it's, it's, we don't know where the money goes, nothing. I know that black folks ain't running this. Yeah. So, nationally. So we kind of have them bringing down the, the, the statues, but because it wasn't led by the Angela Project with these with these churches, with these, there's no repar- rep- reparations behind that bringing down the statues. And so now this is the consequence. And I still have to tell you guys, the timeline is wrong and it's the same paper. You can't come mm. to somebody's conference in November the way that they did and then cover a reparations project the way that they did just like a month ago or three weeks ago. It just doesn't work that way. I don't know how to explain it to you guys. You have like, you you basically are then obligated. You put the, like, you came. We have Marianne Williamson. We have, see, I, I think part of what happened is we gave the wrong story. We gave too perfect a story. Combination of myself, you know, my background, being an attorney, a, a Emmy nominated for a document, event working for the DNC. It's really hard to frame somebody as conservative if they work for the DNC and you didn't. I'm just saying. <laughs> and then, so then you come forward and then, so that's the two people. And then you come to the conference and you got Cornell West there, and he's not there for 10 minutes. Yeah. This man stayed there for eight hours. You got Marianne Williamson there. This is a highly liberal like space. Then you got the church, Dr. Cosby, black church, some white folks in there. Then you got ADOS people. Every ADOS person that, that the New York Times tried to question gave spot on answers because we on point. So they <laughs> want to ask, that's what just happened.
happened. Yes, Toto. Like, Toto. Michael fire is on. Fire is always. Michael Dyson tried to come at my man that's an Air Force, that's in the Air Force, and tried to slip and slide him today. And what he said was on point. Down ballot Democrat. Dyson got quiet because he don't got no answers. Yeah. I'm saying this to you because they don't know what to do with us. That's so okay. right now what they're trying to do is replace us with this BLM message. You can't afford that. If you got kids, if you got a grandma, if you got a house note, you can't afford for BLM to be your, your vocal point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we have three minutes left, you guys. Um, we want to try and give you some, some room uh, with some final thoughts. Um, the conference you talked about, you know, the burning question is... Yeah, Cor- Cornell West with, is in. I heard he's in. He let's, he let's, in. let's get it, y'all. Let's get it. The family wants it. <laughs> Can we can we can we can we get a commitment? Can we get a yes that we're gonna do something this year? I, I fam, listen, I listen. <laughs> I know people. I know people have talked about a virtual conference, and I'm open to that. Yeah, I I'm just it's, that. it ain't the same though. It's just not the same. I'm yeah. not saying I'm closed off to it. Like yeah. I just I want to see where this COVID goes, and if we're gonna have vaccines or what's gonna happen. Because I'm not saying we can't do something virtual, but I would like part of part of what was so important about the last conference to me is that. It was like a family reunion. It was Absolutely. like a family beautiful. reunion. It was beautiful. Right? Yeah. And, and, and people didn't put on airs. Nobody thought they was better than anybody. We was all together. We was all hanging out. Everybody was like, they knew everybody. Everybody, oh, that's, that's your name online. This is my name online. You remember me here. You remember me there. <laughs> you know, I, I want that. And maybe that's my own selfishness. But I want that again if I can have it again. Uh, amen. So, you know, I kind of want to feel this out because it doesn't necessarily have to be in October. I'm sure if something happened and we got the, we, we suppressed the virus by winter, we could do that too. You know, so that's just, I just want to, I, so that's kind of where I am in terms okay. of holding out because I, I kind of want the experience that we have. And, and let me just say this, given everything that we've been through, like from COVID to the, the unemployment and everything that came with it, I kind of think we need that. True. Like as a family, I mm-hmm. kind of think yeah. we need each other in a, in a way that's, that's, that's not necessarily virtual. Yeah. So, you know, that's kind of where my mind is with it right now. No, I, I feel um, right, man. I feel, go ahead, Tom. Do, I, do we have? Do we have still have time? Yeah, yeah go ahead, Tom. Ahead. Do you got that wealth gap chart? I just, I'm not going to explain it. We are. We all kind of know in the chat. I'm looking. Um, if you look at the first chart, I'm not even going to deal with the second one with the bars. We oftentimes focus on the hundred trillion dollars, the hundred trillion dollars of wealth that we have, that white folks have now, and we have two point six, some nominal. But the important thing I think I want to point out is. In 1989, whites only had 24 trillion. And in 1980, they only had 11 trillion. And before that, it was even less. The reason why that's important is if they had, understand, up and from slavery until 1980, white people only got to $11 trillion. In the wealthiest country the world had known as a group. From your lifetime, they got to 100. Yeah. I don't know if we understand what that means in terms of, your, of how much information your grandmother or your boomer parent can really give you about this moment. I don't know if we know how much information that means about what Yvette has said before and years ago about a map and the fact that their map is dated. I don't know if we know what that means about our future. But what I am saying is that we got to be willing to be able to rewrite our future in context of honesty about the data, honesty about our lineage, and honesty about what that all means when you mix it together. And right now, I think that we're only on the cusp of getting that honest. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to want you to find out because you know on the twenty third, if you if you didn't know, for those five hundred people in the chat right now, on the twenty third they end the extra bonus on unemployment. It isn't the thirty first, mm-hmm. so just know that. So when that happens, I don't want you to then find out the cost of not being able to call your grandma. Yeah. You got to start thinking about that today. Meaning, call your mama for money, for actual assistance to get through this moment. And I, I'm just saying. Now is the moment for us to really rectify what is the consequence, what is the cost, and who can help me through this, and how can they best help me. Yeah. And it might you not know. be bad for some people to move back home, move back home and truly yeah. regroup. Like, I'm a, I'm regroup. Man. I'm there was a great article in the Atlantic about that. There was a great article in the Atlantic about that. Like, yeah. 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 all this, all this back stuff home. that people have been going through, like, it's a, it's a new world. And everybody needs to understand we're in a, we're in a new world. And the, the, But the old world was leading us here anyway, just right. not that. Yeah. It just, it just, like it just sped, sped it up. up. Sped it up. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, we're, we are running out of time. But before we go, um, you know, we're less than 100 days out from this election. You chapters are sprouting up all across the nation right now. Uh, Ados on the grassroots are getting involved, getting engaged. I, I'd like to hear like what 
in an ideal world, and I know we're not ideal right now. We got COVID, and and you know we have you know police election. brutality, er, the election, everything <laughs> is is bearing down on ADOS right now. But yeah. in an ideal world, what would you see the ADOS kind of movement morphing into? Like it, in your vision, if you if you could look it's, out five, ten years, where would you see? Let ADOS? me say let, let me say this right now. Let's just look. You, you see now you said. Let's just look I know at we got twelve months. months. I, we I, can't even talk. I, about I heard. I, I heard you talk. I heard. You, I heard you. Twelve months. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. 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 I'm talking about what I said with Cornell. Okay. Um. The thing is. The thing is. Five to ten years. We don't like because it. This thing is economically throwing America on a topsy turvy. But let's talk about the election. The problem we have right now is 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 multifold. But I'm gonna talk about two, and then I'll let Yvette come in. The first part is we don't have Biden out on the campaign circuit. So ADOS can press him and ask questions and and like what we saw with Jenny on yeah. last year. So what happens is whatever is the status quo, particularly when you have an issue like COVID, is so blankets everything else that this other dialogue is much more difficult to have. As particularly if your own organizations, your NAACP, your Black Caucus, are clearly not advocating for even ADOS existence. I don't know how that works. 400 years of slavery and Jim Crow. And I'm not talking about the hashtag. They act like black people that are here in America are not like a, a, a distinct people. Mm -hmm. But in addition, this is the second part. As a result of Trump almost conceding the election, for so long, me and Yvette have dealt with some of the most ignorant political points. I, you know, I, I defer to Yvette in many, in many aspects of politics because that's her expertise. But I do have a, a general knowledge, as, as everyone do, else does. And what I do understand is that when Biden runs 12 points ahead of Trump and Trump also concedes the election, which almost seems to be the case and his handling of COVID, his release of Stone recently, um, what you have is a situation where there isn't that leverage to create the discussion. Mm -hmm. See, if Biden was mm -hmm. running the points behind Trump mm -hmm. and also or at even even now yeah. you have some you can leverage the black vote and everything else. But when he's running 12 points ahead. I think he's more trying to just take care of the white vote. So, you know, I still advocate down valley Democrat. We still do. We still demand reparations. And I, I just think black folks are going to have to really start pushing for uh, recognition of themselves. Absolutely. And I'll leave it at that. Let me let me just say this. Let me answer your question um, direct. You said, what is what is what, what do I see this? Like, yeah. where do I envision this? This has to become a way of life. Yeah. Like, And, and, and when you talk about a way of life, regardless of what happens, yeah. see, one of the things, I don't say that we should be anybody or mimic anybody. We have a specific justice claim in this country and a specific lineage. What I will say is this, though. When you see a Cherokee, that's a Cherokee. They know who they are, and they're going to be that all day, and they're going to advocate for that all day. When you see a Jewish American or a Jewish uh, person, in, uh, whether they be in Israel or here, they know who they are, who their people are, whether they were in the Holocaust or not. They know their history, and that's who they are. They're going to be that today. They're going to be that tomorrow. They're going to be that all day. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be that unapologetically yep. all day. Yep. What I'm saying is that this is life. ADOS is your life. Whether you realize it or not, you have to be that, understand that, celebrate that history, and move forward in that in terms of politics. And we have to create a political culture around that. Mm -hmm. We got all kinds of cultures. We got hip-hop culture. We got food culture. But somehow, we decided not to develop a political culture. And so we have to develop a self-interested political culture. And it don't matter what happens. See, one of the things I got I to gotta just say this. It don't matter what the little fight you might lose or feel like you didn't win or it didn't happen right. It don't matter. That's life. We all have 100 years or usually less on this planet. Mm -hmm. That is life. Mm -hmm. You will deal with your losses, suck it up, and keep moving because you're not moving just for yourself or what you lost. You don't want to be involved anymore because something went wrong. You need to get yourself together, chin up, chest out, and do what you got to do for yourself and the people that come after you. You can't just think about this in terms of a single life. This is about a single lineage, and you have to do your part, just like people who came before us suffered and did their part. You have to anchor yourself and know that this is a lifetime journey from the from the from the cradle to the grave, baby. That's what that's go. You know that's what we do, that's and you right. have to you have to be in it for that, not that's for right. an individual win, but for who we are, and take pride in this journey. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we can end there. Right. Yes, identity, Thank pride, you. long term project. Thank you we so much. We can end there. Yeah, that was perfect. Thank you you guys, um, thank you so much for being here with us today. Politics thank and you, Black. I mean, so, seriously, sincerely. To both of you, I have nothing but love for you. Um, ADOS LA, a lot of the work that we do would not have been started with you. We literally are people 
who heard your messaging, who came off of social media, and then who activated together. So thank you so Absolutely. much for being here. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thank you, fam. All right. All right thank you. Right, fam. Thank you. All right, now. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Well. So, family, I just want to say quickly, if you're not already following Yvette Carnell at Breaking Brown or Tone Talks or, or Antonio Moore at Tone Talks on YouTube and social media, you need to get right. You need to go right now and follow it and subscribe to their channel so you can you can ingest this information because what they are telling us is we got to have pride. We got to know who we are. And this is a long term project. If you are ADOS, this is this is where you need to be. And you need to be advocating for a black agenda and reparations and fight and getting in this for life for life for life. That's what I heard. <laughs> Uh, we got transition here. Uh, California Bill AB three one two one. The regents of the UC system uh, want to create a task force to study and develop a reparations proposal on June third in a vote of thirteen to four. The Appropriations Committee of the California Legislature voted in favor of a task force to study and develop reparations for African Americans. This task force will focus on uh, resulting racial wealth inequity due to slavery and institutional racism. This is a win, not just for African Americans, but for Californians at large. Yeah, AB 3121 is an important measure, fam. And out here in California, ADOS California has again been working closely with our lawmakers to make sure the language in that bill is acceptable and is specific enough to make sure it's gonna make a difference and, and actually benefit American descendants of slavery. And so we appreciate ADOS California, uh, you know, hats off to everyone north to south that's been putting in that work, showing up every day, yes. calling, calling in, uh, expressing your opinions, going, showing up to hearings. Showing up to hearings. Uh, you, you move the needle and we got to win with AB 3121 and let's get it on home. All right. And just so you know, Politics in Black, you can follow us uh, on YouTube, ADOS Los Angeles. Like, share, subscribe. On social media, I am uh, Friday Jones. I am Chad underscore Boogie. Uh, second Sundays, last Sundays, we will be here for you, Politics in Black, giving you politics from an ADOS perspective. Absolutely. And before we go, I just want to give a uh, shout out to Kim Davis, NYC ADOS. She lost her mother recently. Kim, just know we're a family. Personally we love you. Love. We, we love you, and we, you're in our prayers, and we're sending you strength and love, sis. All right. Peace, fam. Next time.